I just got done talking with Susan Varlamov. She's the Director of Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia, where the Bulldogs live. And I met her probably about a year ago at a creation care event. And I was really drawn in by her story of um, experience and advocacy for our environment throughout her life. She's held a lot of different roles um, in multiple locations as well. And she just has a wealth of knowledge to share with us about um, the environment, taking care of it, statistics, she's sharing experiences in this um, conversation. And we're also talking about this pandemic and how it's affecting climate change. And uh, spoiler alert, it is in a good way, which is really exciting and encouraging. Um, and uh, lastly, one of the things we talk about is an action plan that she and a team of scientists from the University of Georgia created in response to Pope Francis's encyclical um, called to action for taking care of our world. And um, this is actually like in talking with her, I'm having the realization that this is the first time that I've personally really um, felt confident and understand what action we can take to affect the environment and slow climate change. And so um, I'm filled with a lot of excitement and hope right now because all it takes is for us to actually do it now and um, for us to do it on a, on a grand scale across a lot of different people and movements. So there's a lot of really great um, nuggets of information, facts, um, science, and ways we can get involved in this conversation. And I think it's one you're gonna wanna watch, so let's take a look. Well, Susan, good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today about our environment and all the work that you've done throughout your life. I'm really, really excited to get into that because um, I know you have quite the story to tell and a lot of history in your advocacy work. You've been a huge advocate uh, for our environment and um, you even have something to say about our global warming. And so there's a lot here. So thank you so much. Welcome to the conversation. Um, can we just start out by giving a brief history, and I know there's a lot, but a brief history of your advocacy work and really help us understand kind of some of that passion behind what you do. Thank you, Stephanie, for having me. Um, when I was a young mother of uh, three children, we moved to Minnesota, Eden Prairie, which in fact is uh, part of the story of Little House on the Prairie. And it's, it was a beautiful uh, neighborhood. And unfortunately, two blocks from our home was an open landfill, an open toxic landfill that we later um, found out about uh, was going to be expanded. And um, my youngest son was four years old and this whole thing absolutely frightened me. And I went to some meetings and a group of men took on this fight to say to the landfill company, this is not going to be so easy. You know, you're not going to be able to do this. And um, they burned out simply because they could not continue going to meetings during the day and hold their jobs. At that point, they found uh, toxins in the groundwater below the landfill. And I had a little sister that died at five years old. We don't know from what, but it seemed like it was some environmental hazard. My father used DDT and there was pesticides that they found in the landfill. So putting that all together, it terrified me that I would be reliving this. My sister died when um, she was five and my son was four. So um, I decided to get over my fear of speaking in public and then went to meetings and finally galvanized the whole community and it took us eight and a half years, but we ended up shutting the landfill and um, it was a precedent setting case. And I realized that industry is very uh, focused on making profits over, you know, people's um, well-being and health. And that was a big eye opener because I thought if I could just, I'm a biologist, clearly explain to them, this is a bad idea mm -hmm. that they would um, back off and they did not. So we brought in scientists and, and we were able to finally, um, it wasn't even the science. It was the fact that the community rose up against them and the city council finally realized that they would have no choice, but they paid for a lawyer to take this on. 
and um, public opinion crushed their hopes of expanding a landfill and making millions and millions of dollars, risking the health and safety of our, our neighborhood. So um, it was a big, big lesson in how collective action can make a difference. So I decided that this is what I want to do with my life. And I went to graduate school, moved to Georgia, went even to Georgia Tech, received a master's degree, then worked for the um, Department of Natural Resources for a number of years. So um, if uh, I can continue that, um, basically um, I was at the Pollution Prevention Assistance Division and our job was to reduce waste, uh, working with companies to reduce waste. And I went to the landfills to see who, what companies were putting what waste into the landfills so we could back up and see how we could help these companies reduce their waste. Um, and it turns out that, um, oh, the other thing I did when I first got to Georgia, I helped a, an African-American community prevent the expansion of a landfill in their neighborhood. It was a very poor neighborhood. And um, I agreed to testify as an expert witness. That was extraordinary in that I could see these people were absolutely defenseless. And I felt so bad. It was like um, in To Kill a Mockingbird, where I was in this courtroom and the fans were uh, spinning overhead and the, the room was filled with black people. African-Americans uh, kind of even rocking in their chairs, listening to me. And they said, pretty girl, thank you so much for helping me. Mm -hmm. And I was stunned, you know, and finally we won, we won that case. But the governor had some connection to the landfill company uh, and um, an intimate connection with the landfill company. So um, when I worked for the Department of Natural Resources, he found out I was there and he asked, me to be removed from my job mm -hmm. and eventually I was and I was devastated mm -hmm. because being raised Catholic I thought justice will prevail but I not taken into account politics it was a big awakening for me so I thought I'd never work again and then um, I was hired by the University of Georgia I had been a liaison for the research and education garden in Griffin and um, I love to garden. So I kind of changed focuses and worked in sustainable gardening, gardening to um, uh, enhance ecosystems. And so I eventually wrote a book and worked uh, in Griffin and then was moved to the offices in um, Athens and became an administrator in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. And uh, the, I was I had a wonderful job. I was able to really use my skills uh, organizing people, plus my background as a biologist and environmental advocate to, to try to do some really good things I felt for the state. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, I, I know there's even a lot more to that story because I've heard you tell it even in more depth. Um, that was an incredible overview. Um, I think I think the some of the lessons there that you, you've learned about collective action and that our voice really does matter when we try to rise up and, and bring justice, um, I, that really stood out to me. And I just want to point out too that I think you had said previously that that case in Eden Prairie took eight years, right? That's correct, but it was a revolution. You know, it's it was kind of revolutionary idea of people doing this. And it took um, George Washington eight and a half years to fight the revolution, too. I used to say that it takes a long time to convince people because they thought I was a bit odd, you know, uh, doing this in the beginning. And then as we gained more information and presented this to the, the people, they realized how important it was to get the slam fill shut. So gradually it took a long time, but people came on board. And that's what we have to do now with climate change and but we don't have much time yeah yeah oh and i'm really excited to get into that and and maybe we talk about that now but i have kind of a loaded question for you and take sure. it in the direction you'd like to go um but i'm just curious i mean in all the years of your work that you've done what are some of the things that you've learned about our environment like are there any like 
really important facts, experiences, insight that you have that you'd like you know people to know about? Several things that we're all connected. We're not in charge. We're being reminded about that in this pandemic. Yes. And that we need to allow the animals to live in their habitat. We've got our civilizations. And that how quickly, how quickly um, a virus as we have now can infect the entire world. It's a very simple organism. We are very complex and it can spread so quickly. We are hosts, can bring us down. Yeah. And that um, we have, we absolutely have to be respectful. The other thing that I've learned is that the environment can renew itself. Uh, it, it can, for example, in the Valdez oil spill, they said Alaska would never be the same. It would never return to its original state. And in fact, it is thriving. And so I am very hopeful that if we can get under control this issue of climate change and do a number of different things that we know we have to do, we can recover. Yes, yes. Oh, and since you bring up both the pandemic and the climate change, I think that opens up another question. Um, how, are you seeing any research or any stuff going on around um, how either the global pandemic is affecting climate change or kind of what you project could, it could affect, like how could, it, how could it affect climate change? The pandemic is affecting the, the earth in a positive way. Um, for one, of course, we can't travel. So um, we are using less oil. In fact, our oil demand is down 35%. And production, they've reduced to 10%, which is not enough. We don't have enough reservoirs to take all the oil that we're producing. Um, and they're, they're reluctant to, to cut, cut back too much because we don't know when we begin to open up the whole world what our demand will be, but they feel, most experts feel, it will be down at least 10%. Wow. Greenhouse gas emissions are down 9% just in two months. That's extraordinary. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Um, the air is cleaned up. It's cleared up in the big cities like Delhi in India. You can see it's clear. The other thing in a lot of these big cities is, um, people did not realize that there were birds and wildlife because with all the noise, the background noise, you couldn't hear, you couldn't hear birds and frogs. And so now, for example, in London, you can hear, you can hear birds and, and the wildlife in New York. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And I think people are realizing this. Yeah. And so I'm hoping we certainly all understand we're connected with this pandemic mm -hmm. and how much we need each other and how respect we have to have of nature because nature can take us down. Yeah. That if we can continue with that respect for nature and also reduced use of transportation, we can work at home. We can have clear air. Yeah. We're, we're going to be better off as well as the earth. Wow. See, that's what's so exciting because we've been hearing this lingering conversation about climate change for quite a while now. And um, it always feels so like such a big issue. Like it's scary. Like I think half of us or half of the time, like I don't want to acknowledge. I mean, I know that it's real or I believe that it's real, but it's like we don't want to necessarily <laughs> acknowledge because we don't know what to do. And I think um, this pandemic while it's horrible, is kind of giving us a little bit of insight into some of the things we can do. Um, and I know that you um, wrote an action plan for the state of Georgia through um, the Catholic Church Archdiocese. Can you just share a little bit about the background of that and like how it came to be? Because I think it sheds a lot, really great light on actual things that we can do that really can make a big difference and maybe help us understand why those things can make a big difference. Sure, five years ago, the Pope came out with a um, encyclical, environmental encyclical. The Pope is trained as a chemist. So he is concerned 
with the degradation of the natural resources of the planet. And he knows that they cannot support life on Earth much longer with the way we're consuming the natural resources. So he wrote a 185-page um, encyclical. And I had heard this was coming out. And um, I thought, gosh, if I could help him. I am a writer as well as a biologist. So I thought, well, maybe I could, you know, um, review some of his work. Anyway, it turns out that I did get an invitation to speak with the um, Archbishop here in Georgia. And he laughed and he said, Susan, you cannot work on this encyclical. It's an inside job. But he said, you know what you can do? We need an action plan. An encyclical is a letter to you, normally a certain group of people in the church. But this one was a letter to the people of the planet. It was a call to please, you know, respect creation and respect one another. We are integral parts of creation. And he made that point. But it was not a, okay, this is what you need to do in your everyday life. So uh, we wrote that with a group of scientists at the University of Georgia. I called on my colleagues, a group of interfaith, uh, interdisciplinary scientists, and we wrote this action plan in six months. So um, my colleague who is Catholic uh, and a geologist, we did that together and we had it reviewed by a climate scientist, very famous climate, climate scientist, agricultural engineers and others. And so we released that. And so that is what we are doing through the Catholic church, but it can be used by all churches. And um, so it's basically, you know, uh, reduce your energy, water, waste, and there are ways to do that. Everything from reducing energy by shutting off the lights when you're not in the room to putting solar power on your roof. And there's different things for people of different means, but everybody can do something. Yeah. And I've seen it, um, and I actually probably should link that below this video so everyone can see it because, I mean, there's pages among pages of really great ways in which we can do things, and it runs from easy to intermediate to more advanced, I've seen. And so, um, really, I believe there is something for everyone. Um, and I think, I think understanding the context of which it was created, that it came as an action plan out of you know, what the Pope is calling all of our world to do really helps us drill down and, and makes this issue of what do we do about climate change that much more tactical. And it doesn't have to become as scary anymore. Um, maybe I'm the only one that thinks it's scary, but I, I doubt that I am. Um, and so thank you so much for creating that and starting to spearhead that. I mean, that's just, a, that's literally a gift, I think, to our world. Um, so thank you so much for that. I would like to add, too, that the point, um, you know, the Pope is seen as a moral leader in the world. And um, people respect the Pope, and that's why these scientists of different faiths agreed to work on this with me, because it is being used by other faiths. It is being used by Catholic archdioceses around the country, but also by Ebenezer Baptist Church and the Episcopalian Church. And so um, why shouldn't the churches be um, demonstration sites for reducing energy and water and waste and setting up a community garden? So I believe in the power of the pulpit. I believe in the power of the imams, the rabbis, the pastors, to call on their people, they have tremendous power, to call on their people to say, we've got to save the planet. Yeah. And it's, well, we save ourselves that way. And they, these are the things we all can do together and to make that a focus in all these different faiths. And I, I am very hopeful we can do that. And we are doing that in the Catholic Church. Yeah, I, I love that message of hope. And um, it made me think about, which, <laughs> just going back to, you know, what does it look like? Like, what is the timeline um, that we're kind of fighting against to make this change? Or what are some of the indicators that you've seen or you look for to see if we're making progress? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Um, we're talking a timeline of 10 to 12 years to try to reverse this. 
and the biggest way we can reverse it, it really is um, to reduce, we've got to keep the oil in the ground. Mm -hmm. Greta Thunberg is very good explaining this. We have to keep the oil in the ground so we're not releasing uh, CO2, we burn it. Yeah. And we've got to replant the earth. We've got to put in trees and plants to take in the CO2, to draw it down back into the earth. And we have to do this on massive scale, mm -hmm. but I, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a book on sustainable gardening just because I think gardeners are very closely, they're intimate with the earth, we're digging in the dirt, teaching them how to plant plants well, but to renew the soil, the soil can take in so much carbon dioxide if we make it fertile. So that's what I'm doing in my small little sphere here, but it's being sold all over the country to the, the book. So the book called Sustainable Gardening for okay. the Southeast, okay. but these principles can be used across the country. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, the topic of gardening is very relevant right now too, because I, I don't think I've ever seen, seen more people gardening than um, this summer. Again, I think another positive outcropping of this pandemic is people are home and have time, but also um, we're realizing the importance of being able to grow our food and have that access when we want it and need it. And um, I, I don't have a garden, but I'm tempted to make one. <laughs> it's a good observation yeah. that the, um, people are trying to grow their own food. Yeah. Um, so that's a great thing. And churches too. Um, the Pope is from Argentina. And down there, it was very poor. There were a lot of political problems. And so at the churches, they had farms. And the priests worked on the farms to feed the people. Yeah. And a lot of Catholic churches are doing that now. They are growing community gardens. And they are feeding their people, people that need to have fresh food. Right. So, again, it's another great thing, outcome of the pandemic. Right. Yeah. And it's an outreach opportunity too, if we have fresh food to be able to give it um, to people that need it. So that's awesome, which <laughs> leads me to another question. And I know we're jumping all over the map here, but I guess that's what happens when you have a real conversation um, is that um, I know that the environment and people who are living in material, material poverty specifically are very much interrelated um, and that the ways in which people living in material poverty often have to live impacts the environment and then the environment often impacts um, people that are in poverty or even just people that are, you know, in a more vulnerable place for whatever reason, like in Eden Prairie, they were taking advantage of, you know, the, the neighborhood right near the, um, the, the dump area, right. and the same thing in Atlanta. So can you just speak a little bit on what you've seen throughout your life? Uh, maybe if you had any examples or anything of kind of taking advantage of people through this environmental issue. Yes, that's unfortunate. We call that environmental justice, where basically these chemical companies, the landfill companies, mm -hmm. they will site their facilities near poor people because they know they're not educated and they can't defend themselves. And it's just horrible. It is just horrible. So there's a whole movement to try to rectify that. And Al Gore has uh, looked at that also. So um, they and they, uh, we had one of our climate scientists who worked on the um, Laudato Sea Action Plan. He did an analysis in Georgia of communities that are vulnerable. And um, there, are, there are also people like living in cities, they're living in the poor areas, but they can't afford air conditioning. So they are pounded on when the, when the heat goes up. Um, and so, yes, it, it's a big, big problem. And then of course, in the third world, these people are packed so closely together mm -hmm. and they're often near toxic facilities, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we've, and we've got to make the world aware of that. And, and we are, we are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So are there any tangible examples that you have or seen in your experience where we actually have made a difference towards the environment so far? Yes. There's two very good clear cut examples. 
when we saw the connection between CFCs and the ozone hole, we banned CFCs worldwide and the ozone hole now is shrinking. That's extraordinary. The other example is in Georgia. In At the turn of the last century, the farmers planted cotton from the mountains to the sea. The boll weevil came in and destroyed the cotton. You know, the cotton um, was kind of like a host for this, but the boll weevil. And so the farmers had to find another crop. And so they chose trees and they kept temperature records during this period of when the, the land was open cotton fields till it was shaded by trees and the temperature dropped one degree Fahrenheit. That's extraordinary. Yes. And it shows how collective action can make a difference and how important planting trees is. Wow, well, um, I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to say, um, but I think, I mean, we did a really big overview of a lot of topics, um, and I know we could probably talk for a really long time, um, just knowing all of the experiences you've had and everything that we've, we've discussed too. Um, but is there anything else that you'd like to say before we kind of wrap things up? I think really ask calm people to live simply. We really don't need a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Really live simply. Um, and support local farmers because I worked in the College of Agriculture. We desperately need them to grow our food um, and support local businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but to live, live simply, be yeah. respectful of the environment. And I think. Um, if we do that, uh, we will go a long way to mitigating climate change and that we, we are interconnected. We have to care for one another. Yeah. We have to give each other a lift. So I think, and again, we're not in charge. Be respectful of Mother Earth. Yes, I love that. And I, I what really makes me energize about this conversation is the message of hope within um, that we recognize there's a problem that we're trying to work against and it's a big global issue it's you know it threatens our existence um, yet at the same time we have these this action plan we have um, people like you and your team and people that you other people scientists at UGA and I'm sure across the country and across the world that are working on this too and telling us the information we need to know so that we can make changes in our daily life and um, that really does bring me a lot of hope and um, I really I, again, I'm, I'm just very grateful that you've taken the stance and um, put an effort into helping us see and understand that. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Oh, one more thing. Yeah. Everybody, plant, everybody plant a tree. There you we go. all plant trees that takes in the carbon dioxide. Yes. That's a big one. So um, anyway, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your interest in this uh, subject. And I hope you can get this information out far and wide. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's an important topic because it affects humanity. And that's what I'm focused on is how we as humanity can better um, grow and love each other and all that. So thank you so much, Susan. This has been an incredible conversation. I know that we'll stay in touch. And um, so I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Stephanie. It's been wonderful. Wow. I am walking away from that conversation feeling really excited and encouraged probably for the first time about this environmentalism climate change issue. I think I just have a lot of confidence in what Susan is saying. Her um, track record and experience in this area is incredible. She's done a lot of advocacy work and she's right in there with a the team um, from UGA. She's staying up to date on all the things in this area and to hear from her a tangible examples where we have made an impact in the curbing climate change and the fact that we now have an action plan of which to combat that combat that um, I feel confident in that I now can understand 
how we as individual people can play into the whole of, of combating this. So anyway, I hope you find this encouraging too. And of course, if you do, please share this with someone that you think will find it interesting too. Um, and I will link the action plan below this video so you can take a look at that and look at implementing um, or seeing how you might be able to change some of your habits to become more sustainable. And um, a video comes out every Tuesday on Love Light Stories. So if you go to lovelightstories.com, you can sign up for an email to receive that the next time a video drops. And until then, I'll be thinking of you, I'll be praying for our world, and I'm going to be looking at ways and I can change a bit of my habits to become more sustainable. So I'll see you next time.